Welcome to On the Ballot with Ballotpedia, where we take a closer look at the top political stories of the day. Ballotpedia connects people to politics by providing neutral, nonpartisan, and reliable information on our government, how it works, and where it's headed. I'm Jeff Palais. Thanks for being with us. Today, I'm joined by Republican pollster and strategist Patrick Ruffini, who's the co-founder of Echelon Insights, a polling and analytics firm. Ruffini got his start working for President George W. Bush, first with the Republican National Committee, then in Bush's administration and on his re-election campaign. Since launching Echelon Insights, they've advised strategy for Republican and international campaigns, as well as Fortune 500 companies and advocacy groups. His writing and research regularly appears in the media, and he published a book earlier this month called Party of the People, Inside the Multiracial Populist Coalition Remaking the GOP. Patrick, thanks for coming on the show today. Thanks, Jeff. It's great to be here. So uh, for our listeners that might not have heard of Echelon Insights, tell us a little bit about the work that you do. Yeah. So we, uh, as you described it, we are a polling and data analytics firm, and uh, we do work across the spectrum of clients from political campaigns, candidates, but mostly I would say our, our work centers around outside groups, um, corporations, trade associations, people who are um, not necessarily political, always political candidates themselves, but are uh, whose work intersects with the political process or uh, is looking to or are looking to advance an issue uh, and uh, a cause that they, uh, you know, that that is core to their mission. Um, We, uh, in addition to our work uh, in the polling realm, um, where uh, num- have, w- having won a number of accolades, but also uh, having been ranked as one of the top five in accuracy by 538 last uh, cycle in terms of how close we got to the margin in uh, the races that we polled in the 22 cycle. Uh, we uh, also uh, do uh, a, a lot of innovative work, I, I would I would say, in the digital realm to uh, understand social media sentiment around companies, around brands, around candidates, as well as um, uh, work to uh, in developing products uh, to help uh, groups better test creative and test advertising. Um, so we would start out uh, engaged on a typical issue or a typical campaign doing your standard benchmark poll, your message testing poll to figure out not necessarily where you stand uh, on the ballot and what your odds of victory are in the fight that you're facing, but uh, which message is going to get you uh, past the finish line uh, with a win. The missing piece of that is people test and have tested messages can at the high 30,000 foot conceptual level. Um, but when it comes to the actual creative execution of those messages, that often falls short or it doesn't land in the way that's intended. So uh, we've developed a creative testing platform that allows for clients to do randomized control trials on uh, advertising testing, you know, five, 10 creatives at once head to head against each other to figure out which of those ads is going to be more likely to move the needle on a ballot test in an initiative fight or even increase sales for a product. Right. It's kind of like an advanced version of A-B testing, I guess you could say, right? Uh, The the technological tools are are really uh, advanced in that respect. Without perhaps sharing too much that that you wouldn't want to give away in a podcast like this, what what do you mean by when you say there's an innovative approach to all of that? Uh, Can you tell us a little more about how, how does that actually work? So in our DNA, we started out uh, almost 10 years ago now. So uh, it's been, uh, in some sense, quite a while. But we started out in a moment in time uh, when, like today, even back then, people were really questioning the viability of traditional polling. And back then, traditional polling was defined as primarily landline polling. Uh, We just started to use cell phones, or, or the polling industry had just started to use cell phones. Um, But you had various misfires on the Republican side. You'd had a 2012 election where, you know, the Romney campaign was famously convinced that it would win based upon its internal polling. Um, You had uh, the week before we launched the Eric Cantor primary, uh, which you folks remember that the Republican uh, majority leader of the House of Representatives goes down 
in a, in his primary. You know, he was widely tapped to be speaker and comes out of nowhere. Challenger comes out of nowhere and knocks him out of the primary. Uh, and his polling showed him 30 points ahead. Uh, so we did not decide to start the firm as a result of that, but it could not have been more perfectly timed. And our view at the time was you can't just have one set of data or one data source or source of truth that you're relying upon. Um, and that usually in the campaign setting has been the traditional survey. Uh, you need to be taking in information from a variety of sources, a variety of modes. You need to be more open to conducting online surveys, which I think the industry has broadly speaking uh, adopted that. Uh, you know, we were among the first, I think, partisan pollsters to really embrace uh, that as a tool that, you know, we would apply in, in, in you know, a wide array of settings. Um, but, um, but also uh, taking a look at the digital realm and the digital conversation and figuring out what's a smart way to incorporate that, given that there was so much uh, snake oil really on the digital side of the ecosystem uh, and people selling, you know, we can predict elections based upon tweets, right? And it, it's obviously a whole lot more complicated than that, but we wanted to and have developed methodologies around, all right, here's how, here's what you can glean and what you can understand about the issues that are really pulsating through your base or through your uh, core base of supporters in a way that oftentimes is a little bit more real time than the polling that you're going to have. You know, even the most active polling program, you're only going to be in the field a certain amount of times throughout the election cycle. But um, the ability to track uh, your share of mind on digital consistently uh, and be able to track your digital stream of data consistently. So we wanted to bring all of those ideas together under one roof in one firm. My initial background uh, was not in the public opinion research space. It was in the digital space, um, uh, running and helping run some of the first digital campaigns um, for President Bush at the RNC um, back in the early 2000s. And I really saw the need for how do we bring, um, you know, it was a big leap for me, right, to kind of make the jump from one part of political consulting to another. Um, but I believe very strongly that this was the future in terms of how do we bring um, everything, uh, everything we can learn from the digital space and improve the way that organizations make strategic decisions with it. Why do you think that there was a resistance to digital polling in those early years? Yeah, I've, I'm so struck by that because you're right, that, that went on for, I think, quite a while as well. So um, you've kind of a sense of like, why was there that resistance? And then what eventually turned the corner? Uh, well, I think that there's a lot of resistance because there is uh, an almost religious belief in the poll is you randomly sample uh, from the population. So if you have a group of people who has maybe signed up to take a survey online, that is not a pure, perfect random sample uh, of people. And so, uh, you know, there was, I think, an initial maybe healthy skepticism, let's say, of that. Um, but in 2012 in particular, um, what you actually had was the online polls actually came closest to estimating the election outcome. So there was a sense of, well, of course, because if a method isn't quite random, then it's not as good. The quality of the data it, you get is not going to be as good. Um, but I think a lot of those concerns were laid to rest by the fact that you had in 2012, the online pollsters actually came the closest in Obama versus Romney. And you had gold standard operations like Gallup really had egg on their faces in terms of uh, I, I, in, such, in such that they ultimately had to withdraw from horse race polling entirely, um, the more traditional, some of the more traditional polling operations. Um, so I think that was a, a, a turning point that we came into existence shortly thereafter uh, and riding that wave to some extent. Uh, I think the main driver right now, you had a flood of new entrants into the into the market and uh just as i experienced in the early digital campaign space like initially you had only a very few firms that were willing to that really stick their neck out and say we do digital and then all of a sudden every single everyone is doing it and now we're seeing kind of much the same thing happening in the polling space and it's really been driven by cost um it's not getting any easier 
to survey people. Um, a lot of the, the low, lower cost methods of data collection, such as IVR, uh, it really died. I mean, I think they're, they really just died a, a slow death. Uh, not slow, but it's been gradual. And then all of a sudden, in terms of the death of IVR, uh, as a data collection technique for uh, particularly for small campaigns. Um, so it, it, people are really looking for less expensive modes of data collection. Uh, that has typically meant online. It has meant text to web. It has meant uh, newer forms of data collection. And there's really no choice unless you know you want you have the big budgets to be able to do a kind of a pure perfect random sample poll uh, using you know, live call or interviews exclusively. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned, um, smaller campaigns just now. So, um, we, we talk about something a lot on this, uh, podcast and we talk about this through Ballopedia's newsletters and, and articles that there's 585,000 elected officials in the country. There's a lot of candidates running campaigns, uh, at the local level of office. I'm curious, do, does your firm work with local candidates very much, or do you find that there is less appetite for you know that kind of uh, campaign consulting work at the local level? Is it a mixture of both? Uh, wh- what do you see in that respect? Uh, you know, I would say it's not our bread and butter. There are a lot of people places that do it, um, just in terms of the extremely high volume of polling. Uh, that you would need to serve local offices. And, um, you know, a lot of our clients are, are really kind of looking, I would say, for deeper, you know, large, larger scale, deeper into an issue or to really plumb the depths of figuring out like a message, right? So, um, and oftentimes that's very difficult to do at the local level. Often it's just not feasible, right? I mean, you don't have... Uh, the survey universes, um, you know, the ability to get at first 400 people, then 300 people, then now it's like down to 200 people. And some of these like local geographies, it's just very tough (laughs) to do it. So what if there's only 50 people voting, right? (laughs) For those really small races. uh, Hyper level candidates. I mean, in some cases it's just not an option, right? For the the vast majority of that 500, those 500,000, 500,000 plus offices, it's not an option. Many of them uh, are are uncontested as well, which uh, if you're in an uncontested race, you probably don't need to worry about going out and hiring uh, any kind of polling firm or information like that because you're in an uncontested race. Yeah, and, 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 yeah, and, and you also have so many that are, you know, it's foregone conclusion, right? Even if they're not uncontested, but a lot, oftentimes they are. But, uh, you know, it's a foregone conclusion with polarization, what's going to happen. But I, I, I just, I just harken back to uh, uh, it, it, the need to invest to whatever, uh, you know, at whatever level to get the intelligence to actually figure out if you do have an opportunity or what the path is if you did have the opportunity, because everybody runs. Right with the hope or with the ex- with at least uh, a plausible case that they could have an opportunity to win, and so uh, you know having the ability to execute that is uh, is really important. I mean, I look at uh, races like this happening in Virginia, um, mm-hmm. with in Loudoun County in particular. Uh, you know, a Democratic prosecutor, um, you know, one of these progressive prosecutors was removed. Uh, from office uh, or looks very likely to be removed. It's very close right now um, by uh, somebody who spent seventy thousand uh, dollars in a Biden plus twenty five county. You know, I bet that that candidate didn't necessarily have a huge amount of campaign infrastructure in neighboring Fairfax County, where I live. The Republicans didn't even run a candidate. You know, and against a very controversial incumbent uh, for that office. So I, I do think that the ability to really have your accurately to have your finger on the pulse of and not necessarily asking just straight up who you're going to vote for questions, because that's not going to be helpful oftentimes very early on in the cycle. Um, you know, you really want to get a sense of the mood of the voters around the particular issues that uh, you're dealing with as an office. Yeah, I wondered, you know, kind of speaking to your point a little bit that um, as technology continues to advance and as more and more tools are kind of available at the local level, if you might end up seeing some more of that polling or information gathering go, because here's a really concrete example where we've seen this over the years, more and more local candidates just set up a Facebook page now and not an actual formal campaign website. 
then you can actually learn quite a bit about the candidate's stances from watching them interact in real time with voters through comment threads. It's a, it's a remarkable way to see how a candidate, you know, views an issue rather than like, you know, a tested issue statement that was, you know, written for a campaign theme section of a website. So I wonder, do you think that as, you know, the next few years go by and as, you know, there's more AI advancements and more technology growth that some of those little candidates might say, you know what, for, for not much money, I can go do a small sample size test of some kind of an issue in my jurisdiction. Maybe that traffic light is a really important issue and I need to test like 50 voters on that. Do you, do you think that might grow and increase as some of those tools expand? I am a very excited and I don't necessarily have, you know, I talked about those religious, uh, you know, the high priests of the old polling world of gold standard telephone polling. And, you know, I would say to a candidate like that running in, a, in running in a particularly in a local race, you have to be this is where you have to be the most flexible and open and innovative about how you collect information. Uh, even if it's, uh, you know, just making sure that, um, you know, when you're doing your doors, you're collecting and you have a method, uh, for capturing what those conversations are at the doors, because I think that can be extremely valuable. I'm not, uh, I, you know, I'm not one, you know, who is one of these people. I mean, I know, uh, most political consultants hate yard signs, right? Um, but I'm not one, you know, who discounts, let's say, some of these more, uh, you know, the ability to not necessarily count yard signs, but the ability to even with these face to face door to door conversations, um, you want to be leveraging, I think, your infrastructure uh, to capture data from that to understand really what are the things that are coming up unprompted in your conversations with voters to catalog that, to log that, and then to re- ultimately reflect that back on people in uh, the message that you put forward. Yeah, now yeah, it's really interesting. It'll be really interesting to see how that evolves in the next few years. So kind of shifting gears a little bit, what is the most common question that you get asked by you know, family member or you know, you're know you out at a restaurant and someone says, what do you do? And you explain your job and they're, what's the most common question you will get about how, how does polling work, right? That's kind of this like, everyone knows what polling is, but I feel like people don't always know how it actually works. And I suspect that they probably ask it often. So what do you find in your experience that people are asking most regularly? So two things, it's like people assume we know what's going to happen with certainty before anyone else does. And I, I would just say that the instances of that are just so few and far between. Uh, the, that we actually know that in advance or actually have a better sense in advance. Uh, you know, maybe we're, we're the ones who have conducted a poll and no one else has in a given race. And we know something temporarily that we have a slight advantage or some, some slight insight that others don't have, right? But that, I would say it's pretty infrequent or we have a, a, t- a perspective on a race that's slightly different. I'm typically not sharing that in a restaurant if I have. <laughs> that's, that's number one. Um, but uh, 99% of the time and about the things that people want to know about, which is usually, you know, is Trump or Biden going to win? I don't necessarily have, a, you know, a much more refined sense of that than the person who might be following the polling averages or the things that people might be reading in terms of just the underlying kind of core uh, ballot question. I, I, you know, I think that, it, you know, to some extent uh, that has been endlessly covered. It is not necessarily to some degree it is not knowable at this point in, at this point in time right um how the next election is going to turn out but that is by far uh a uh you know something that people assume you have predictive let's say a predictive power that um you know i think doesn't really exist and i think that's true by the way of all political operatives and political consultants like you, you people assume you're a political insider right you must know you must have your real finger on the pulse of what's going on and yeah, I'm sure that there's on a lot of issues that are not covered endlessly by the media that people don't actually really want to know about. That that might be true to some extent, but on the issues that are more covered, it's not that there's that there is any kind of an advantage. I go back to 2016, the night of the election, the Trump campaign did not know they were going to win. And Justin, that was just the same and did not think they were going to win. And that's pretty much the same as everyone else in the country at that point. 
Uh, the second one is, uh, you know, kind of like, how do I trust polling if I have not been polled, right? Uh, or, you know, how do I either, uh, you know, uh, you, you know, you do get this, uh, you do kind of get this sentiment, right? Well, it's only 800 people. It's only 600 people. Uh, I've never been polled. How do we, how do, how do I know it, whether to believe it or not? Um, what I would say to those people is you probably have been polled, but you're screening on call. In fact, that is a near certainty, particularly if you live in any kind of competitive battleground state, you're almost certainly uh, this election going to be receive a polling phone call because the number of people who are actually answering those polling phone calls is plummeting from election cycle to election cycle. It's down to something like a fraction of a percentage point. In the golden age of polling in the mid 20th century or like, you know, the 1960s, 70s, you get about 30% of the phone calls you make would result in a completed interview. Now it's, again, a fraction of a percentage point. That means you have to dramatically expand the number of people, the number of, of attempts you make to try to reach people. That means that, yeah, you're actually like, you're pulling a list, particularly for these local races, uh, you're pulling a list of practically every single registered voter in a district who has a phone number uh, to sample them. So yes, you've been polled. You've just either your carrier's blocking the call or something, something is going on to intervene. All the reasons why people don't actually answer, answer the poll, the, the poll. Um, and that's really behind a lot of the shift to online polling because, uh, you know, it is getting so difficult oftentimes to do it on the phone. Yeah. I mean, the phones, you know, default to, a uh, suspected spam, you might not want to answer this. Uh, and then most people won't, um, yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, what what happens is that number keeps shrinking. Like, is there a is there a breaking point at which that number becomes too low, and the polling industry thinks that phone calls actually is not a viable way to get a, a sample size anymore? Uh, I think that there are more and more instances where that's happening. Uh, you know, whether or not that would happen at a statewide level, um, and we'll know about it based on the, the industry will adapt and move to try to figure out different modes of data collection. Um, and try to innovate their way out of it, right? Um, so I think that you're already seeing it with the greater volume of, of surveys that are done online. I think to some extent that uh, uh, you know you have some of these modes of collection, even landlines that are productive, but only because you only have like a, a very narrow limited people who have landlines anymore. And those are probably like highly committed and are probably very like older older voters. Um, a major innovation in the, let's say, probability polling space in the last couple of election cycles has been texting. Um, you know, we were among the first to, in 2018, I think it was, experiment with text to web as a, a as a polling method. Um, and uh, that wasn't, uh, you know, you have some, some vendors um, where the interview occurs over text you have uh but the, the, by far the more common technique is you text someone a link and they take the survey online so it is a form of online polling quote unquote uh, in the sense of they're taking the, the survey you know on their phone uh on their mobile device um typing in responses but um in terms of the mode of data collection it is pretty it's close to uh, the mode of sampling. It's pretty close to what you would get from just having somebody call someone on that cell phone. You're selecting them randomly based upon their cell phone number. So I think that that has been an innovation that has certainly helped with drive down costs. And it's just another way of reaching people. Uh, you're, you sometimes have to both call and text people to uh, get them to answer the phone. Yeah. Do you find that um, the are there transaction costs, I guess you might say, for people trying to answer the phone or you know, people being polled, they feel like the transaction cost of answering via text or a website is just easier or more relatable than answering a phone these days. Is, is that kind of what they're finding in the industry? I don't think, I'm sure this will change, but you are pretty much exclusive. I mean, I, I think there's a pretty high open rate and response rate on texts. There's not a high open rate and response rate on emails. So you're seeing a lot of political fundraising migrate to text, but also to some extent that challenges the polling industry who's also trying to rely on that channel because if people come to expect that 
uh, you know, the text channel is now full of spam, then uh, that will impact people who are conducting legitimate bona fide research um, over those channels. Um, so I think that that's a challenge, but I think that, that, that partly the reason why it's just easier to grab someone's attention with a text as compared to, okay, I have a call from an unknown number. I'm going to, I'm just going to ignore it or I'm going to have my, or my yeah. the iPhone you know, kind of filter it. Right? I wonder if you're going to see that with, uh, with texting, because I think your email was like that in the early years of email. If you got, there wasn't that much email. So you, if you got an email from a you know, campaign or a poll, so you'd be, Oh wow, look at this, an email. And then eventually it became so common that it, it became noise and everyone started to tune it out. And then eventually Gmail said, you know, we're actually going to create separate folders for this called like promotions and, you know, other buckets that you don't ever even see necessarily. And I wonder if we'll see that with text messages in future years where it's like, well, if you get a text message from someone who's not in your contacts, you're actually not going to even see it. It'll move to a separate folder entirely. And then that will cause the industry to have to respond again, I guess, right? Tactically. Exactly. I mean, it's going to be a game of whack-a-mole for sure. Yeah. Okay. So let's um, have to move on then to the to the next election uh, a little bit. So one thing I've been wondering about is what is you what is engagement going to look like from the American uh you know, political voter. This campaign is shaping up, at least from what we can tell, both, you know, obviously presidentially and even down ballot to be one that it seems like the average American is a little more tuned out of. They're either already set in their views. I'm either on team A or I'm on team B and I don't need to do any research then because I know where I stand. Or they're looking at this as like, well, it's a, you know, repeat of 2020. I don't have a lot to learn about the candidates. So I'm, I'll vote on election day, but I'm not going to be that engaged otherwise. What happens in the election cycle to the campaigns or to organizations like yours if you're in a really down engagement cycle where, again, the voter turnout might be about the same? But what if people's attention is completely turned away from politics from January 1st, 2024 to November 1st, 2024? What does that look like from your perspective? I think from our perspective, not a lot. I mean, I think it's just to be candidly, uh, right? I mean, I think we're going to still going to conduct the same polls and, you know, a poll that shows a lower level of engagement is just as valid and equally valid as a poll that would show high level of engagement in the, in the process. Um, so uh, it just uh, it requires us to apply different techniques. Um, you've, I think, given voice to... A belief that is growing that this may not be a high turnout election uh, and I would extend the let's say lull in engagement to voting on election day I think there's no really reason to expect if engagement is down which we're actually seeing engagement down by the way in fundraising uh, in online fundraising on both sides but um, there's some talk about being you know especially down on the Republican side I think you're going to see that manifest on election day to an extent where uh, it, you know I mean it's just uh, the lower political engagement is going to mean lower turnout dissatisfaction with the candidates is going to mean lower turnout that changes some of our assumptions about who is in and not in the electorate um, so we have to be a little bit more careful about saying, well, in 2020, uh, we're kind of assuming a high turnout election. We issued a call uh, on turnout for 2020 that was with the one, within 1 million votes of the number of votes that actually were cast, assuming based upon higher engagement we were seeing across the intervening election since 2016. If we continue to see lower turnout, um, that will change the models that we use to calculate turnout. Um, it will certainly change some of the numbers. And I think it's also the third party factor in this election. Uh, it's going to scramble things even further that you're not really polling a two-way race, that you're actually, there There could be a you know very serious and viable third party candidate who gets into the debates uh, for the first time in over 30 years. Um, so that will also, I think, change the dynamics of how we ask questions and try to get at uh, kind of a three-way uh, dynamic versus a two-way dynamic. Well, it sounds like it'll be a challenge then for, you know, for pollsters and campaigns to understand the data of the cycle then, because there's a lot of new variables or changing variables. So 
Right. And you can't rely. And I think that these particularly these cycles where at least we'll see we'll see how many of these kids get on the ballot. I mean, I think that that's all that's the whole ball game here. Yeah. Right. You, yeah, you ballot, ballot access. Yeah. Ballot access. Right. So we may be having this conversation in six months and it's not it turns out to not have been a, a big deal. But I do think that uh, these cycles where you do have a high third party vote uh, or a higher third party vote are really ripe for some form of realignment that then reverberates in future election cycles. So you look at the, uh, you know, the 2016 third party vote, um, you know, was a more of a traditional Republican vote that then shifted into the Democratic fold. And they just needed to take that middle step in order to get there. It was a small but crucial number of voters, particularly in a state like Georgia and states like Georgia and Arizona. Um, you know, the 1992 third party voters were Reagan voters who, uh, you know, kind of uh, voted for Bill, you know, eventually probably voted for Bill Clinton or became uh, more, uh, less Republican as a result. You had the 1968 Wallace voters, right, who were transitioning from Democrat to Republican. So as a result, I mean, I think it's interesting and potentially exciting that we might see the current two party polarization scrambled a little bit. Hmm. Well, that's going to be a really interesting election cycle. They they always are. Uh, so, so ask you two more questions. Then I want to ask you about your book first. I mentioned in the introduction. So, uh, can you just briefly sum up for our listeners the the argument that you're making in the book about the changing makeup of the Republican Party and its priorities? Uh, so, I do argue that there's a realignment, right? And it's a realignment we, we, we've been seeing in the shift of work, white working class voters to Donald Trump in 2016 that we saw in 2020. Uh, with the rise of more Hispanic voters within the Republican Party, more Asian American voters, more voters from these new immigrant groups in the Republican Party. And you're seeing it in early 2024 polling uh, with further gains among Hispanic voters, but also potentially black voters, gains in black voter registration for Republicans in states like Florida and North Carolina. Um, You're seeing a lot of evidence, kind of small bits of evidence mounting um, that the fundamental makeup of the parties is changing. Um, and it, it's this has been a long process, certainly not one that's exclusively tied to Donald Trump. Um, so um, you've had the Republicans become the party of the non-college educated, and that is non-college educated across racial lines, um, which as a result of that, um, you have kind of the racial polarization, right, where... You know, white voters were primarily in the Republican Party and non-white voters were in the Democratic Party. That has broken down. You've also seen this shift in the identity of the political parties. In terms of the Democrats used to be seen as the party of the blue collar worker, the party of the people. That's the title of the book, right? And that mantle might be shifting over to the Republicans as they attract more voters um, who are not college educated and as a result, sort of more on the bottom end of the economic spectrum. You saw it in the recent UAW protests where you had both Donald Trump and Joe Biden going to Detroit. You used to be that, uh, you know, you wouldn't see Republicans. Uh, Trump didn't go to the picket line, but you saw other Republicans go to the picket lines. But you would never see that before. And now you're seeing it. So it's about all of those changes, why they're happening, where they came from and where they're going next. Very interesting. I know it seems like they're, it's often are sort of attributed to Donald Trump, any kind of changes that have happened, but you're, so you're kind of contending in your book that sounds like that, it, you know, it goes deeper and beyond that, that started before that. Is that kind of what you're getting at? Yeah. I mean, it started before you go back all the way to the 1960s, uh, where, um, you had, uh, kind of this realignment of working, more working class whites. I mean, it was defined differently then because almost no one had gone to college at that point. Right. So it wasn't defined in this terms of educational attainment. But you did have, you know, more working class whites kind of moving away from the Democrats. Um, Then you had and then it kind of stays kind of the same for a number of years. And then in 2000, all of a sudden uh, you have this creation of this the red blue divide. Um, And the red blue divide was really you had more working class rural areas uh, shifting red. And you have this huge mass of red counties on the map um, that's really visible. And then you have the urban blue, 
Um, that's more consolidated, a Democratic vote that is consolidated in fewer and fewer counties. That was part of this realignment. And then in 2016, you then have the sort of last vestiges, I would say, uh, of white working class uh, support for the Democrats kind of collapse in the upper Midwest, um, you know, and that uh, generates this huge sea change in the Electoral College where Republicans now have the advantage in the Electoral College because those are obviously very crucial states. Um, so, um, you know, it really has been, you know, it hasn't been like necessarily a clean progression over 50 years, but there's definitely been, you know, a few mo- key moments in time where the realignment accelerates. And, you know, I think, look, we might see it come back, retrench a little bit, um, but I don't, I wouldn't bet on this reversing on, on, unless and until, you know, we have an entirely new definition, right, of what the parties meet, right? Maybe, uh, you know, uh, when we're living under AI, <laughs> the <laughs> set of challenges right. are going to be fundamentally different in our economy, and we're going to reorient around those. But for right now, the, uh, all the politics of globalization, the politics of, uh, of trade, and a lot of these issues has really shifted uh, between the parties. Yeah, I mean, what is a political party is certainly an interesting question and actually varies by state because the qualifications and requirements for how to uh, get on the ballot and get certified are different. And, you know, we just saw an election in, in Pennsylvania where uh, someone lost the Democratic primary but took the Republican nomination and then won the general election. So what is a party then in that case, right? It could always change. Well, great. One last question that is kind of a plug for you. Um, you you have a newsletter, uh, the weekly newsletter, I believe, the intersection. And it's super fascinating for our listeners who don't subscribe. So I've actually been a subscriber. I've never had a chance to ask you about it. So how is it that you go about curating all the very interesting content into that newsletter? What, what's kind of the philosophy you guys have behind that? Yeah, so we have a Slack channel every week and we're posting links to interesting things that we see um, both from Twitter or X now and uh, the web uh, from uh, various sites that are, uh, you know, fair, uh, you know, we, we have sites we look at to find links, but we will also just kind of see what kind of piques our interest as we're surfing Twitter or social media throughout the week. Um, and I have found that to be, um, a, you know, it's very much about spotlighting other voices rather than necessarily sharing my own take on things. Um, I do in my newsletter write original pieces and commentary and analyses of different things, but um, primarily it's, um, you know, every Friday, um, the intersection is the kind of roundup of links throughout the world of uh, polling data and technology and uh, just different data-driven ways of looking or learning about the world is sort of the unifying theme. Uh, Going back to the founding purpose of Echelon, right, we didn't want to rely just on traditional polling to understand the world, that there's, you know, kind of big data, there um, are uh, larger statistical analyses that are constantly being done and uncovered or deep cool data visualizations that um, really do a lot to explain demographic trends or social trends. And um, so we really kind of try to collect all of that. And, and, you know, I would say that like, you know, the process of writing a book, right, it, it, that was really invaluable. The reader support for this kind of format uh, was really indispensable to that because I felt like I just had as a result of putting this together over the last um, five, six years, um, access to an inexhaust, like a, a, a everything practically of, of importance that hadn't been published on these topics. And so I, I'd already had like a good research base to start from. When there's a mountain of information out there for people to sift through, having a curation point is really helpful uh, for all of us out there today. So, well, Patrick, thank you so much for your time today and your expertise. This was a really fun conversation. I hope you enjoy it. It's going to be a very interesting election cycle because it always is. And I hope you have a uh, wonderful holiday season and a great 2024. And uh, I'm sure we'll have you back on the show sometime soon. Thanks so much. And for our listeners, you can learn more about all of these races and more by checking out the links in our show notes. But before I let you all go, you may have seen posts this week from organizations celebrating Giving Tuesday, an annual day of generosity. This year, we highlighted Ballotpedia's Fellows Program, which offers students across the country volunteer opportunities while learning research and writing skills and inspires political engagement. Since 2020, 
Ballopedia fellows have contributed over 12,000 hours of research work and have helped Ballopedia provide millions of voters with robust information about candidates that are on their ballot. And the Ballopedia Fellows Program has entered its 12th session this spring and is actively recruiting right now. Please visit donate.ballopedia.org slash giving Tuesday to support this important work and nurture the next generation of nonpartisan information providers. We'll be back next week with another episode. Make sure you subscribe to On the Ballot wherever you listen to podcasts. I'm Jeff Pile, and thanks for listening. <laughs>